Hey Trainer Road team, I've been cycling more seriously for a little over a year now, how, or a little over a year now. However, with not much structured training. <laughs> Chad, Chad can't, put in parentheses. Can't call triggered. training if it doesn't have structure. Sorry. <laughs> what is that? That's the truth. <laughs> yeah, it's just right, riding uh, your bike. That's the, that's just, the tag. Yep. Yeah. And sleeping without the chillo is, is just resting your eyes. Right. So, um, <laughs> slow, long group rides are my endurance work two days and faster, short group rides fill my intensity needs. Ooh, that's so tricky. I see a lot of people say that they're like, yeah, well, I don't do training anymore. Cause I do this group ride and it's really intense. The, the point of structure isn't to make things intense and hard. It's to make things precise and structured because mm-hmm. that's how you can, if you can have a precise approach, you can get precise outcomes, right? If you don't, then it's just left up to the whims of whatever that group ride wants to do to you that day. So, um, like most, I'm looking to get stronger and that's Cody, why you should look at structure. So Cody says, everyone talks about how to raise your FTP. And I've heard many different answers to how to raise mine, whether it be from fellow riders from online sources. I always thought to raise your FTP, you need to spend more time in zone four, uh, meaning the threshold zone is what he's talking about here. Uh, base riding included, he says, uh, and then, um, so I assume he's talking about doing threshold amidst like base, like low, long, steady stuff. So way Chad? I take it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm guessing, but I think so. Okay. Got it. Um, so that's his assumption. He says, however, some suggest that high intensity interval training is equal, if not more effective in raising one's FTP, which confuses me as you don't spend any time in zone four, but it, it these are his words, but a high power outputs, which range from 15 seconds, uh, 15 second sprints to five minute efforts. Um, it would be great if you could clear this up, uh, or clear up this doubt if I have, as I have, because I'm sorry, people speaking is hard today. Uh, he says, it'd be great if you could clear this up or because I haven't heard anyone back this claim up by science. Thanks a lot guys. And really enjoy the podcast. Okay. So, um, I, I get kind of triggered whenever people use the term hit because it's, I see it used very incorrectly across the internet in many different scenarios. And then there's this whole concept that, um, people say that you do one or the other. And as a result, that's how you get there. Um, Chad, we have a lot to break down on this one. (laughs) Yeah, I'll I'll try to be quick about it, but this is a really good question and it's relevant to pretty much everybody. So Cody, first off, I want to give you a, a, a warm welcome to the world where everyone's an expert. You've made it clear that you're open to suggestion. So you're going to get advice that ranges from spot on to complete garbage. So enjoy differentiating, which is which. Okay. So I'm going to try to lean more toward something productive here, something closer to spot on. And I want to make this a little more basic than, uh, I just don't want to get too detailed with it and dilute the point that I'm trying to make. So the goal really is to increase your aerobic power. Um, you may have heard that term as build a bigger aerobic engine. So FTP is the height of your aerobic capabilities. You go a little bit harder and your time gets really limited. You go way harder, it becomes too anaerobic, your time gets really limited. When you increase your FTP, all you're doing is increasing that aerobic power. That's really what we're after. And I like the term aerobic power because when we start throwing acronyms and fancy scientific terms like MAP, which is max aerobic power and VO2 max and even aerobic capacity, we start to, I think, lose the plot a bit because what we're after is oxidative capabilities. And yeah, that does sound a bit sciencey, but that is very descriptive in what we're looking for. We want to use oxygen to fuel or in part to be, to be part of the fueling process of driving the pedals. So oxidative capabilities. Now a term I don't like is one that's bandied about quite a bit and it's applicable is that there's more than one way to skin a cat. Every coach has said this at least a hundred times, I'm sure. So if you look at long, slow distance training, that achieves increases in oxidative capabilities via time, via duration. You go with VO2 max intervals. doesn't matter whether they're on-offs, whether they're a little more traditional in nature, and you go two, three, four, even five minutes, they can be highly varied. If you think of those uh, reduced amplitude billets, all sorts of ways to, to ramp up your oxygen intake. Even anaerobic repeats where we're way up 130, 140, 150% of your threshold, if you do them in an on-off nature, or perhaps you start a more sustained interval with a hard start, again, there's a big shift towards improving your oxidative capabilities. Sprint intensity training, as you mentioned, little 15 second, 20 second, 30 second sprints with long recoveries may not seem like it, but if you stack those close enough together and those long recoveries aren't too long, they become increasingly aerobic. And then yes, of course, the, the, the sweet spot or the threshold stuff, which you just described and tempo. And we're going to talk a fair about a fair bit about tempo today. 
So really what you're looking for is anything that challenges your hearts, your lungs, and your vascular systems, your blood delivery system, and of course the muscles. And, and in doing so, you convey a need for greater endurance. So, <clears throat> and, and uh, kind of a side note, but an important one is that the loads necessary and, and the response that you're gonna attain because of those loads are all relative to your current capabilities. So what's a, a walk in the park for one rider is enough to stimulate adaptation in another rider and what's barely enough for one rider is way too much for another. Chad, the can, point I, can I, can I just make one uh, thing here? And I think to try to further your point, you're not just talking about power, like clearly, yes, what I could do would be different than what Keegan could do, right? He can, could do way more power than I could, yeah, but you're, you're not just talking about raw power data. You're talking about the actual duration and everything else as well. Right? Exactly. The stress relative to your capabilities. Yeah. So yeah. that's super important to, to keep in mind for people is it's not just about the raw power data. It's about what you're actually doing, the structure of mm -hmm. what you're doing. And, and maybe really the simplest way to convey this is that you need to understand that your body listens. So if you tell it the right things, then you will get the right answers. It's almost like an endurance question and answer. The question is, how do I increase my ability to utilize oxygen to power my bike? Your body will respond with, here's how you increase it by, by rewarding you with the adaptations that you're seeking right questions asked. So when you ask the muscles, so to speak, for greater endurance, they adapt accordingly. Even your fast twitch or, or your type 2B fibers actually make aerobic adaptations, oxidative adaptations is probably a better way to put it. But especially your type 2A fibers that we've talked about, those intermediate fibers that lie somewhere in between. So <clears throat> long, slow distance gets there, like I said, via duration. Sprints get there via exhaustion. They deplete energy resources really quickly. That sends a particular message. That message is replied to with greater oxidative capabilities. VO2 max basically lives there, just does so at the upper end. Sweet spot and threshold lives there as well. They just do so at the lower end. And then tempo gets there eventually. It's quicker than long, slow distance, and it's less traumatic than everything else. And while we're on the topic of the, of the so-called gray zone that seems to describe tempo work, let's really quickly dispel that nonsense for what it is. If all you ever do is ride in the gray zone in tempo, yep, you're probably not going to get faster. But if you ride every day, if your recovery rides are in the gray zone, you're too tired to do hard work. If your hard work suffers as a consequence, you're not really doing hard work. And this is all attributed to that gray zone. The point is it, it has its purpose, but you can't just utilize it uh, with no real regard to everything else that's going on. It can be a really productive place to train. And it's also a place that's really accommodating. We talk about the fact that you can do sweet spot workouts day in, day out and recover from them quite well. Tempo fits that build just as well. Okay. So moving on <laughs> second, and maybe this is the most important point is that there's no single way. There's no best way to improve those oxidative capabilities. And on top of it all, it's a moving target. So as your fitness changes, the loads have to change in order to stimulate further change. Whether you do that via intensity or duration or frequency or th some combination thereof, you have to change those things as well. Put another way. Chad, you have to say that again, because <laughs> this is the argument. Everyone who knows everything, everyone wants to know the single way. What's the one interval I do or the one type of intervals I do? There isn't. Uh, can you just say that E section again on the dock? Because this is so important and this grinds my gears, especially like uh, it matters where you're at and what you've done in the past. And you can't do, you can't do VO2 max for like two years. And like, it's like, you exactly. can improve as much as if you do a periodized structure. So can you please say it Well, again? see, so rather than say that again, <laughs> let me just put it another way. The, the body adapts to specific stress. So you have to change that stress in order to further adaptation. So you keep doing one thing, body adapts, it gets really good at that one thing. Eventually you plateau. And in some cases you can even go backwards because the body gets so good at it. So you have to vary the stimulus. You gotta, you gotta change it. <clears throat> okay. So experience that. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Chad. I thought you took an intentional okay. pause and I was trying to help you out and I ruined no, it. No, no. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll step back. <laughs> it's okay. There's no rhythm to this. I, this, this is a conversation. I swear. Okay. So ideally, um, any of these changes that you make stay remain in line with your objectives and your goals, Cody. 
you talk about raising FTP, but you need to look a little bit past that and ask yourself to what end. I mean, maybe you're early in your training and FTP increases are really all you need to target right now. Base, new rider, et cetera. That's, that's okay for now, but eventually you have to, you know, you got to choose a discipline, discipline within a discipline, perhaps you got to look at events. You got to look at the course demands of those events. If you're not competitive, you just have to look at the type of riding you want to be good at the type of riders you want to be as good as, or better than, et cetera. But you're going to have to get a little more focused. And you also got to recognize that different writers have different proficiencies. And uh, uh, one of those fancy terms, fractional utilization, which basically describes at what percentage of your VO2 max does your threshold fall? How, how high a percentage of your VO2 max can you work for your sustained periods of time? And Pete and I are really at, at opposite ends of that spectrum and we both perform well. I mean, my, I in my previous days, Pete currently, but Pete is in a situation where he needs to lift his ceiling. His VO2 max, relative to what he can do is kind of garbage. My VO2 max relative to what I'm doing is kind of remarkable. So he needs to lift his ceiling. I need to raise my floor, but do we? I mean, maybe Pete is performing as well as he wants to or needs to perform at the events that he chooses based on what he's already good at. Me, maybe I just don't want to work that hard anymore. So I'm not concerned with raising that floor. I just want to be sufficient enough to not hate riding. I want to, I want to love it the whole time. Okay, so <clears throat> to close all this up, the big takeaway for you, Cody, is don't get lost in the weeds. See the broader view. In this case, it's oxidative capabilities. Go even broader, it's greater performance capabilities. Broader still, it's getting stronger, in your words, getting faster in ours. And there are many means to these ends. And because, Cody, you're in early days, you need to ask bigger questions for now. You need to consider the end game. For you, it's stronger. You need to look at your proficiencies and limitations and then target accordingly based on what you discover over time, because this is a process and you're not going to learn all this right away. You need to align your time constraints with your objectives. You want to be a sub nine hour Ironman rider and you've got four hours a week to train and eh, those things don't align. So you're going to have to, to fix that equation somehow. And you have to recognize the benefit of structure. Again, you have to train with purpose and you have to train with consistency. Structure is what helps you do that. And then finally, another part of structure really is you got to track the changes. You have to assess and reassess. Look at your best. Look at your PRs. Look at repeated or similar race event times. Do something one year and it's a little faster the next year. That's a win. Do something one year and it's a little easier for the same time next year. That's a win. And then uh, you're, you're simply you're rating a perceived exertion. How do you feel during performance? Sure, but especially during training because that's where we spend most of our time. That's where we live. Competition is a, is a very small percentage of that time. Okay, so Keegan, you are a US national champion. You've won a bunch of big races. You obviously, this is what I've been told, you follow a polarized method where you're either in zone one, going really easy, or doing VO2 intervals, and you never touch tempo or threshold, correct? Incorrect. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not possible. That's not what pros do. How do you Nate read it on the internet. It's not possible. Yeah, there's, 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 <laughs> so, I mean, this is, this is interesting to us as, uh, and I think we, we get to see a lot of pros training data, uh, is I think the two things and Keegan, we want to hear more about your training, but one, no pro does the same thing year round, right? They, they all, like all pros do. And then I don't know a single pro that doesn't do lots of threshold and to an extent tempo and Keegan, I think you have like, you do a lot of tempo, right? I do. Yeah. Um, I guess one thing I do a lot of is my, uh, my coach, Jim, he likes to call him like hard endurance and plus rides. So I'll spend a lot of time floating like right on that, like tempo zone two border, like right on that line. So for me, that's like right around, I don't know, 270 to 290 Watts. So I'll just do that for like hours on end. Um, I think for me, that's definitely helped with my like aerobic efficiency. That's like, what is that as a percentage of your FTP? Um, what would that be? Um, probably 75 ish. Probably about 70. Do... You know, FTP is three, around 360. So that'd be 80%. 290 is 80%. Yeah, so it's about 78% then. Um, I'll spend a lot of time there. And then sometimes he'll even throw in like, we'll do intervals within that. So I'll have, let's have like a four hour ride and I'll have like a set of 30 30s or whatever it may be on the top of every hour. So uh, I think for me, it just, it's helped a lot with 
basically just building a bigger motor. Um, the analogy that I think my coach uses a lot, I think it's my favorite one is he's like, you know, it's, you can either like try and modify Honda Civic, <laughs> try and slap on turbos. You can do this and you can do that, or you can just build a V12 and just be really, really fast and really strong at everything. Um, I do a lot of different racing, you know, I do like marathon racing. I do short track, uh, XCO. I do like five hour time trials, FKTs, Everest. <laughs> um, <laughs> I want to be good at all of them, you know? And in the end, I think if you're just a strong rider and you have a good aerobic, like you're just really good at like that like kind of low tempo zone, you can build off that easier. I think you want to build up your, I guess, do you call it your floor? Mm -hmm. or your yeah. Ceiling? And your floor. Yeah, your so floor. I think if you build a bigger tempo base, everything in my mind just gets easier off that. Um, Cause if you go look at like a race file from like a gravel race or whatever it may be, that's where you spend the most time. Like you're going to spend the most time in that tempo zone, that high zone too. Like you're not always doing threshold. You're not always doing like hit work, like 30 thirties. Um, yeah. So I think uh, that's made the biggest difference for me in my training the last few years. It's just like really building that zone and um, spending hours and hours there. <laughs> Keegan, the next question. So there's this idea for polarizes that all the pros do polarize and then us humans like, or regular people don't do it. Your coach, Jim, does he coach anybody else? That's high level few. Yeah. <laughs> can you, can you name some? Cause I think people, uh, uh, I know they are. Yeah. He's with, uh, Kate Courtney and she Chris good? Blevins. Yeah. She's okay. <laughs> she's okay. <laughs> yeah. She's okay. Yeah. And I think for all of us, it was kind of the same. And we started working a few years back, like, you're like, Oh, this is like, this is really hard. You do three hours of it and you're like, this that kicked my butt. Like, I don't know if I can do this anymore, you know, and you just get better. Now I can do it for, I could do it all day. Like I could ride that 270 to 290 zone until like, like I don't know, probably for 10 hours, you know? So I think you just, your body just adapts and then he's like, Oh, you're getting better at that. Let's, uh, let's start making it harder and put some LT intervals in there or we'll do some 30 thirties or like, you're just always adapting it and always changing. Like you guys mentioned, if you do the same thing over and over, you're just not going to get faster. You're just going to get static and you're going to plateau and eventually you might even go backwards. So he just gets constantly making it harder, whether that's changing the duration, adding more intervals. Um, obviously as your FTP goes up, that zone goes up too. So yeah, that's, I, I, I thank you for uh, getting us insight in your training. And my whole point on this is not that no pros do polarize, but just, I actually, I don't know any that do, but uh, in cycling, there are other sports for sure that didn't at first, there's some pros who they found about polarized and they went to it, but I don't know any, Keegan, do you know any personally who like their whole career they've done polarized and that's how they got to where they're at? Um, I don't know. It's hard to say. I do know a few roadies who just do a lot of like really, really easy, like zone one rides. Like they'll go, I guess it's kind of like low zone two, but they'll go ride like six, seven hours of like that super low, easy zone. And in my mind, like you're kind of just, wasting your time like you can get the same amount of work done in four hours if you just ride a little harder um so i think like obviously maybe it's a little bit different but i think um yeah it's like kind of goes back to the whole junk miles thing if you're just out there like aimlessly pedaling for six or seven hours like what are you doing like you're missing out on recovery just, time at the very least right like yeah exactly three hours think, extra that you could have yeah. been recovering and if you're looking at kj is like you can go do like I can go do close to 4,000 KJs in four hours. If you're like on the gas the whole time, or you can do 4,000 KJs in seven hours. So, um, yeah, that's, that's yeah. that. And I think, Anyways, uh, my, my point is just that, uh, cause I, mean, I triggered about probably 300 people who are going to at me now on our forum, but <laughs> it's just not a hundred percent of the pros. That's what I'm, that's all I'm saying is it's not a hundred percent of the not, pros but, doing polarized. Yeah, they go back to polarize our easy rides are really easy. And I think a lot of people don't fully understand that. Like I'll go out and ride like hundred to 120 watts on my recovery rides. I just super easy. It's barely turning the pedal. So like, yeah, you got to have your easy days and then you have to have your hard days. But and, there's not and, a whole uh, lot so, of like middle ground. I got to say this, John, just because you do easy rides does not mean you're doing polarized. Okay. Yes. This no. is, that's actually what I want to clarify. Tempo sweet spot threshold. <clears throat> Yeah, Correct. I want to clarify yeah. that because Keegan, when you say your easy rides, how long is your easy ride? Uh, about hour to hour and a half. Yeah, right. So that that right there it's, breaks that association where if you're going to do that low intensity, you have to do hours and hours of it, right? Like yeah. your goal that day is to do a very easy day, and that's why. Yeah. But see, I don't. I don't think polarized training was ever. 
was ever meant to be a training model. I mean, even Steven Seiler, he didn't put it out there and say, okay, this is the way you need to train if you want to be a professional. <clears throat> he observed professionals and noticed that's the way they trained. It wasn't, we, we start here and you need to follow this trajectory in order to reach these, these high ranks. Rather, it was, this is what the fast professional riders do. And it's really a product of, they spend so much time training that obviously they're going to have to do most of their training in a really easy territory. If the productive, the other type of productivity is going to come from the really high intensity training. It's, it's something, again, it was observational. This wasn't, I don't think even mm. Siler meant it to be a model to push out to the masses. Yeah, but uh, that gets confused a lot. I'm sorry, we didn't want to talk. I, we're, the hate mail. Uh, <laughs> just send it to Jonathan. <laughs> Bring it. <laughs> don't send it. Because we're me. right. Go man. to the forum. The, <laughs> so to, to Chad's point, it's more of like uh, if you're getting the 20, 30 hours per week, we talk about this all the time. You can't fill it up with uh, intensity, right? And uh, yeah. you have to do some easy work inside of that. So it's kind of if you do that volume, you do get more of a you're going to have a lot more easy riding than hard riding, of course. Um, and now the question is, well, then if you can only do three hours per week, should you have the same percentage of easy to hard that someone with 30 and we absolutely think no way hard, no. uh, hard, no, mm -hmm. right. That's, you're not going to get the same gains. And as you increase it, you're going to be doing more and more easy stuff for volume just because you can't recover from those, uh, those high hard intensity workouts. But we also think that there is benefit to threshold sweet spot and in certain cases, tempo work too, uh, where it's not just all VO two max, like long intervals, a lot of ways to skin the cat. Oh, geez. <laughs> there we go. Chad <laughs> dropped it himself. Um, it, I, I just want to share this too, because I think it's really important to keep him to go back to what Chad said actually a couple times throughout this, which fantastic job, by the way, thanks Chad for organizing all that information sure. to that, but it should be a specific approach to where your goals, to what your goals are and then where you're at at the moment. And as a result, that means it needs to change and, and training does change and it should go throughout that, right? You should have periodized training and you shift through that. And I, it's so hard because I see athletes that, you know, only have six hours a week and they're like, oh, well, when I need to change, what I need to do is I need to go 180 degrees and I need to like go and do something that's entirely different from what I'm currently doing and change it up. But no, no, it's just, it's, it's measured. It's strategic. It's something that is trending appropriately training energy systems as they're progressing uh, as they're progressing and doing that appropriately. Um, it's, it's just, uh, this is going to create a ton of conversation on the forum. And I'm super excited actually for that, because hopefully what this has done, if you've listened to what we've said here and what Chad has laid out, um, it's scientific and reasonable. So also it's to, to hear what Keegan does. Doesn't mean that all of us should go do what Keegan does. We should do what we need to do. That's what Chad said in this, right? So that's a, it's an important point too. If we, I mean, Ryan Standish train road employee, also a pro racer. He's just tried to do what Keegan does plenty of times because they live together and it's blown Ryan completely out of the water, um, time after time. So <laughs> it's, you know, we're not just supposed to do what somebody else does. Um, but super interesting conversation on this and Chad, thanks for breaking it down. One more plug for this that I want to share is there's a, a blog post that we have that's called what is lactate threshold and how to train it. And Sean, one of our copywriters wrote this one. It's fantastic. And he has a bunch of references, references in here and breaks this down very clearly. And a lot of it kind of deals with what you're talking about in this case, um, Cody, which is how to train threshold and how to raise it. So, uh, hopefully this is helpful for that one. If you like this video, make sure you give us a thumbs up. If you didn't like this video, you can give it a thumbs down, but let us know what you would have done differently in the comments below. If you want to see more of these videos, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. And if you want to become a faster cyclist, check out trainerroad.com. Do it. If you think I have better hair than Jonathan, give it a thumbs up. If not, leave a comment. My hair is better than his.